When you go on vacation, there are lots of ways you can get where you're going. One of the ways might be to travel by, well, it's probably a little bit too small. Or you could take something like this. Uh, but on second thoughts, I don't think this floats very well. This, this is the best way to travel, especially if you're going to Catalina. So join me, John Clayton, and my co-host, Jessica McKay, as we head to the fabulous island of Catalina. We're talking with Greg Bombard, the President and Chief Executive Officer of Catalina Express. What would you tell them about the ship and what it offers and all those kinds of things? Get ready for a fun cruise. Um, you know, we started this company in 1981 and we've progressed through a lot of different boats as we've built the company. And now in the later days, are, we're 29 years in and we've developed some vessels that we think are a lot of fun for the people. So we like to think that people's trip starts here with us. The first thing I noticed when I came out here was how huge these things are. I mean, I thought, I thought they were going to be a lot smaller. You told me a really interesting thing. You said that you designed, not yourself, but you have your company designed them specifically for this route. And that's true. Uh, the boats that we operate here at Catalina Express, every one of them we've been involved in the design and the makeup of the vessel to fit within our, what our guidelines are for what we want the people to enjoy. And in this channel, we like the people to enjoy what we're going to see on the way across, whether that's porpoise, blue whales, gray whales, the migration of the different uh, uh, whale population that comes down our coast and back up our coast. So you want the people to be able to enjoy the trip and actually get outside. And in our route here, you can let the people enjoy a little bit more. We need to be there in an hour, so we really need to be able to operate at about 32 to 34 knots. I see there, you know, and I don't know how many of our viewers know this, but I see there catamarans. And when you get up into the efficiencies, which you need to do for fuel burn and, and speed and other things, we find the catamaran to be a more efficient vessel. How fast can these go? Well, light ship, they'll do 40 knots. With passengers on board, full scoop or full complement of passengers, they'll do 36 knots. Uh, for people watching, say, what is your website and is there a phone number? There is. It's CatalinaExpress.com, and the phone number, the easiest one to get a hold of us going through reservations, is 310-519-1212. Um, I see that you're dressed very casually. You know, when I first uh, was advised that you were going to do an interview and I found that you were the president, I thought, well, the guy's going to come here in a business suit and a tie, and here you are very casual. Well, I like to think Catalina is casual, and I like to present what... I hope people will do it when they go to Catalina, and that is go over there to enjoy yourself. It's a great place to get away to. Uh, there's no reason to have to wear a suit and tie. I think that uh, Catalina, again, is, is points towards casual, so we operate the company as a casual, comfortable uh, company. I see that uh, you've been kind enough to put us in the Commodore Lounge or Commodore class. What is that? It's a class we came up to when we started building the catamarans. Some people asked us for uh, a little bit more amenity that would be... Uh, first class. First class, absolutely. But we look at the boat as all first class. This, this accommodation just allows you to get a cocktail on the house or a free uh, soda or whatever you'd like. Uh, primary boarding, meaning first, first on board, and a little different luggage setup. So we look at it as a place where you can just get away to. It's less seats and, you know, for the person who's just trying to get away from any kind of noise or uh, anything like that. The Commodore Lounge offers something a little different. It wouldn't be possible to think about going to Catalina unless you think about two things. One is the Great White Steamship, and the other is, I remember being an airplane buff, coming and seeing the flying boats to Catalina. And that's exactly right. And as I grew up, I was born on the island, so I'm very familiar with what the steamer did all through the 30s and 40s. and and the 50s and finally uh, went away in the early 60s and actually what we've done is caught on and we've become large large if you want to call them seaplanes <laughs> that's really the scale of service that we went after in the beginning greg thank you very much a very interesting interview well john thank you and here's one of our vessels just returning from the island so this one is starship express another catamaran and, and you you laid this on just so it came at the end of our interview <laughs> timing's everything isn't it <laughs>
Catalina Express boat and I'm talking to Captain Mike Jackson. Captain, tell me a little bit what it's life like uh, on the day-to-day -day operation of being a captain of a boat like this. Well, it's quite enjoyable. As you can see, Joe and I's office is a really nice office. We get to see whales and all kinds of things. Uh, uh, no, it's a lot of fun out here. We enjoy our job. It's, if you like the ocean, it can be a better job. What do people need to do to get into uh, doing this sort of a thing? First of all, you got to love the ocean. You got to put your time in. Uh, you have to have at least 730 days at sea, and you have to take a quite extensive test once you do that. And then you got to pay your dues, get a job, and work your way up. What do you find are some of the challenges to being a captain of a boat like this? Knowing all of its equipment. There's a lot of things to know, and you're learning all the time. Okay, Captain Jackson, can you please give me a little bit of a uh, tour of the helm here and kind of give me an idea what these instruments do? Um, everything's pretty much computerized. It doesn't have a standard helm like you would think of anybody on the boat with a wheel that you can drive. It runs off a joystick. or, And then you've got jets. It's all jet driven, no props. Um, so you can run the jets independent. It's designed to have all types of backup features. Obviously for, like you would have on the dash of your car, you know, speedometer and all that. We don't have that. What we have is a D-Deck system that tells us everything about the motors. You can ask them any kind of question you want of the motor, the history of it, all kinds of neat things like that. As you know, you have your normal things like radar, GPS, let you know where you're at. We have the new state-of-the-art GPS, which is in 3D. It's quite nice. You have an AIS system. That's to let you know all the commercial traffic that's around, where they're at, their name, how to find them, and things like that. We're telling some very interesting stuff about the houses. Why are they all so close together? Well, this is down on the area that we call the Flats. It used to be a tent city at the turn of the century where people would come over and they would actually camp in these striped awning tents. And they would do that summer after summer. And then when the Wrigley's bought the island in 1919, those properties became available for people to purchase. And at that time, they would build a wind uh, break or some sort of roof for shade and these houses literally evolved from the original tents. And as they redo them um, these days, they sometimes still encounter that original striped awning in between layers and layers of walls. So it's like a seashell. <laughs> I see an interesting thing that we're sitting in this little, what do you call this, golf cart? These are our golf carts. I see, I, I say it's interesting because there are basically more of these than there are cars. They are. They're the right size for the streets and they aren't allowed into the interior. The reason there are any cars at all, the interior roads are lots of dirt and very, very rugged. And so the golf carts aren't allowed there. But to get around town, they're absolutely perfect. When is the best time to come to Catalina? I always recommend what I call our secret summer. And secret summer? Secret summer. And that is after Labor Day. Once kids go back into school, we normally have that beautiful Indian summer. The water's still warm. The beaches are empty during the week. Now our weekends will stay busy. There's art festivals, jazz festivals, all kinds of things going on the weekend. But if you really want a, a beautiful weather and a very, very quiet time, the midweek days are wonderful in September, October, and November. Basically, how far are we from the Southern California coast? Well, the song says 26 miles, but apparently it's closer to 21 miles, which is about the length, same length as the island is. You mentioned William Wrigley. I know a lot of people, uh, I think, consider this, this was his home. I mean, what, what did he buy this for? No one knows the actual price. He actually bought into it sight unseen. And then sight unseen? sight unseen? Boy, he had the money though, right? <laughs> he did. He had made his money on the chewing gum. He was from Chicago. He wintered in Pasadena, and it was a Pasadena real estate company that asked him to invest in the island. So he did, and then the word is that two, three days later, he came over to see what he had invested in, absolutely loved it, fell in love with it, and went back and bought out all the partners at separate times. So that's why they don't quite know what the dollar price is, but they think around three million. <laughs> three million? Uh -huh. 
In what year was that? That would have been 1919. And of course, our but houses in, go for three million and up now. <laughs> He bought the whole lot. Wow. But th yeah. that was a lot of money then. It was a lot of money. And he actually purchased the Santa Catalina Island Company. And the island was one of its assets. And then they privately took that out of the company and privately held the company within the family until it became a conservancy. And four generations later, the family wanted to retain the beauty of the island. They put it into a conservancy to protect it. So it will never be developed. We're sitting in the very Mediterranean Avalon Grill that is brand new. And for my lunch, I have calamari and shrimp. It looks absolutely delicious. And butter lettuce. And my co-host here, Jessica. Well, I'm also having the butter lettuce salad that has almonds and cranberries and pears. A little bit of cheese sprinkled on top. It looks so fresh and beautiful. And then I'm also having a uh, an ahi burger, it's slightly spicy. I'm just gonna cut this open right here and let's take a look at this tuna. It should be beautiful. I think our viewers should know that this lady here is a foodie. <laughs> I just love a good piece of tuna, definitely. So look at that. <laughs> look at the, the layers of this, the coleslaw and the tuna. It's gonna be so, so good. I'm gonna give it a go.